Okay, so our last presentation uh, for this afternoon is um, by Stephen. It's uh, quite a different approach uh, to modeling, so it's going to be interesting to see if we can take any components of, of what he presents to put into the next generation model. Great, thank you, Mark, and good afternoon. Um, so I'll be talking today about um, Asian-based models and, and the, their role in fishery science. And I've um, made the decision some time ago to kind of devote my career toward this, my, uh, and that's kind of where I focused my early uh, career days so far. Um, and so I'll talk a bit about um, kind of the role that I see for Asian-based models within fisheries management and stock assessment. Um, and I'll talk a bit about um, two of the models that I'm currently working on developing. Uh, one is called Poseidon. Uh, which is a model for um, fisheries management to sort of um, uh, sort of like a flight simulator of, of sorts to test different policies. Um, and I'll talk about as well an implementation of a um, agent-based model I'm developing in the Gulf of Mexico, which I've used to explore different um, hypotheses about stock assessment. And then um, I'll leave you all with some thoughts about how perhaps agent-based models could be sort of wrapped into or actually used in the future as sort of the um, engine perhaps behind uh, stock assessment as, as one possible option. And so I really like this quote by um, the late physicist Richard Feynman who said, uh, who wrote on, on the board during one of his lectures, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And to me that is kind of um, one of the, uh, major motivators behind uh, modeling in, in fisheries and, and in, in natural resources in general. Um, and that's kind of one of the motivators why I kind of got into agent-based modeling. Um, so within the stock, sort of stock assessment process, you can sort of think about, break it down into these four very general components where you have sort of the fishery data collection process, which has to be done properly and uh, ideally follow some sort of a a statistical design process in, in an ideal world. Um, then there's the sort of biology component of sampling, which also should be done properly and follow certain protocols. Then there's the assessment itself, which we will, we've been talking about and will continue the rest of this week. And then the sort of management side of things where you take the assessment results and try to figure out, well, what the heck do we do with this to actually improve, um, uh, if needed, the condition of, of fish stocks and such. And so, um, Agent-based modeling, my use has often been to pick apart um, uh, these three levels. So are there parts of the fishery data collection process that need to be improved? Are there inherent biases there that then propagate down into the assessment and then bias uh, the output for management? Um, also, it could be certainly incorporated into the biology component and in terms of sampling. Um, I'll talk a bit about how I, I see it as, as a possible assessment tool. I was uh, trying to hack one of my own models to try to get a simple working example together, but it didn't, didn't happen before the meeting. Um, and then I'll talk about management, and I think that's where the Poseidon model really uh, fits in, in best. Uh, if you look throughout the literature, there's quite a few examples of agent-based models in fisheries, and, and the number of examples is certainly increasing um, over the, the past years as computational uh, capacity has increased. Uh, some of the, the many applications out there have been looking at things like topic-specific studies, like what do you do, how do you handle uh, turtle bycatch, and, and those sort of, uh, of things. Um, I've, most of my efforts have looked at sort of the human natural side of fisheries. How can we better understand or better um, represent uh, F as not just one parameter, but actually as this complex process of, of fishing behavior that, that actually occurs? And, and how can we uh, improve our understanding of that to help therefore improve the stock assessment and management process? Uh, and then there's certainly plenty of other examples um, in my own work. Now, uh, my Gulf of Mexico model, now we're, we're looking at what happened during the uh, explosion of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig 10 years ago, how that affected fish population dynamics, as well as the dynamics of the fishing fleet in that year. And if those sort of, we're evaluating how, if those, what sort of effects there might have been, and how those may be propagating through stock assessment as new years of data continue to be collected. Uh, first, I'll share with you all a bit about the Poseidon model for ocean fisheries. Um, it's this horribly long acronym that I voted against and did not come up with, so don't kill the messenger. 
um, but there's a, a large uh, team of, of folks across several universities, Oxford University, uh, the Ocean Conservancy, Arizona State University, and George Mason University, who are working to develop this uh, software platform. And what it is, is uh, this generalized um, age coupled agent-based fleet and, and biological model uh, where the, the fleet, the fishing boat or entities are agentized, but the biology, the fish are not. The fish are, uh, there's an age structured uh, or length structure, depending on what you want, uh, model underneath it that, that handles the biology. And then the agents themselves, uh, the fishing fleets themselves are represented as individual entities. Um, the uh, software simulates special behavior and, and uh, depending on the sort of algorithms you give it, it, it follows different um, machine learning algorithms and you can select different ones depending on the sort of uh, the process you think that your, your fishery follows. Uh, and also the, so, and a lot of, so different from a lot of our fishery models where a lot of the complexity and the detail and, 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 and time is spent uh, in sort of modeling the, the biology as accurately as possible. Here, a lot of the time and effort has gone into modeling the actual behaviors as accurately as possible with a little bit less emphasis going on into the sort of biology side. Uh, the idea is that eventually, so we've got the, the capacity to build this on, on various sort of flavors of biological models, but the idea is that eventually you'll also be able to take this and couple this to certain biological models like Atlantis or Ecopath, um, et cetera. Currently, uh, we have three implementations of the, of the Poseidon model. So we built, when we developed the model, we implemented it in, uh, we developed it by, through an implementation of the West Coast ground fish fishery, just because of the volume of data that's available, and the amount of information that we do know already about that fishery. Uh, we didn't really use it for anything management related uh, in that context. Uh, it was, again, just to sort of case in point, say, hey, you know, we, we built something, it works, and we were able to replicate some of the dynamics that happened in that fishery. And then the two sort of policy-based implementations that are currently underway, that where we're hoping to actually use this tool to, um, to, to move the policy needle are with the Eastern Pacific uh, tuna fishery, and I'll talk briefly about that implementation, um, and that's in partnership with IATTC and, and Mark's group, and then an implementation in partnership with the Indonesian government that's looking to try and uh, help them develop management around their deep water, deep slope snapper and grouper fisheries, export fisheries. The Poseidon model uh, itself, it again, it emphas the emphasis is more on the human side, so it's loaded with things like like market forces and, 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 thing, and such which help drive fisher behavior and decision making. Um, the idea is again to study fisher behavior as, as much as possible to try and improve the agent side of the model. And so we actually have um, a couple of behavioral psychologists who are helping work with us to try and improve the intelligence of the fisher agents so that they don't just follow the few sort of simple um, or relatively simple machine out learning algorithms that we have in there. So we're trying to build out that amount of complexity. Uh, and then um, also to work to understand how the population dynamics then interact with varying levels of human behavioral complexity. Uh, as I said, there are a series of machine learning algorithms that you can choose from, um, and you can sort of pick the one that, that would ideally best, best sort of fit your fishery or, or the data that you have about that fishery. And um, the model then simulates all these individual choices. Uh, it's, it's flexible in terms of the spatial resolution that you want, and it's flexible in terms of the temporal resolution that you want, the time step and, and the grid sort of size that, that you can uh, generate. Uh, it also has, contains an optimizer, and the way the optimizer works is a bit different than you might otherwise think of for stock assessment. So here with Poseidon, what you're doing is you're optimizing, you're, you're, what you're asking the model to do is say, okay, I say, you know, say a stock assessment's been done for species whatever X, and then you know that the status of that, uh, that fishery is, is overfished and overfishing is going on, right? And so then um, typically the managers would sit down with projections, right, and say, okay, well, you know, let's set an, an overall tack that is, you know, maybe 80% of what the projections are because we're going to throw a 20% buffer on there. Great. 
and then we're done, they put the policy and walk away, and then we cross our fingers and hope that the fishery recovers with our policy. Here, what you can do in Poseidon is say, okay, well, what I'm interested in is, you know, lowering the tax. So I'm going to say, but, that, but maybe there are other policy options or policy combinations that would also achieve my goal. Let's say your goal is to um, increase the revenue of the fishery 30%. What you do is you tell Poseidon that that's your, the goal that you want to be, op, to be uh, optimized, to have revenue of your fishery increased by 30%. And then you tell it the list of different policies you want it to try to sort of figure out how to get you there. And so what the model will do is it'll try all these policies in all combinations that, that you ask, it, ask of it. And then uh, it will find you the set of policies that get you as close as possible to that 30% uh, increase in, in revenue, essentially. And that's how that sort of optimization component works within the ABM. And then, of course, running these sort of simulations under different conditions allows us to learn a whole bunch of things about these different fisheries, such as how these policies might play out. Um, again, it's not the sort of leap of faith effort that, that most managers uh, still are sort of implementing in most places around the world. Um, and helps, and very importantly, to avoid unintended consequences, consequences of policies that uh, may be put in but may have a deleterious effect on another fish stock that was not considered or may not work out quite as expected because fishers are innovative and are able to sort of learn and, and adapt as well. Uh, so first, quickly for the, um, I can point you all to a paper if you're interested in more of the details of the sort of machine learning algorithms in there. Um, but just to say that when we implemented this for the West Coast, the uh, machine learning algorithm so the, the, it performed a lot better in with respect to getting, uh, essentially recreating the sort of past trajectories compared to other more statistically sort of locked methods. So if we sort of force, forced the agents, if, if you know, we fit choice models to, uh, to, to the uh, fishing fleet to sort of explain their behaviors and we put those choice model parameters back into the model though, and, and, we, and we ran the simulation. In other words, those um, runs were, did not come quite as close as allowing the agents to be adaptable and learn in terms of recreating the past of, of what happened. And that was um, with that implementation of the ground fish um, fishery. So um, these two slides are out of order, so I'm going to pretend like they're not and, and just do this. Um, so uh, this is, slide is just to remind you that Poseidon is not a stock assessment model. Um, it could be with, with some modifications in the future, but it's um, categorically different from stock assessment models in the sense that, again, um, it's optimizing on policy, not so much on past data. And you can think of it more as sort of a projection framework for projecting um, things forward in time. Uh, and then I mentioned that we're implementing this for the, um, in the Eastern Pacific Ocean for the, the, one of the implementations is for the tuna fishery. And um, this slide is just to show you all that there are several different fishing strategies that are employed in the Eastern Pacific Ocean tuna fishery, which includes uh, sets on dolphin schools, sets on freely associated schools of tuna, as well as the use of uh, fish aggregation devices to try and um, improve catchability. And uh, in the kind of question that we're tackling with IATTC is to try and obtain, use the Poseidon model to obtain a better understanding as to how the, uh, the FAD, the, the floating object fishery operates with respect to seeing if there's a way from a management perspective to Re, if, if we to limit or reduce the number of floating, of op, floating objects and if that would then translate behaviorally to a reduction in catch and, and ideally in, then an increase in biomass. In this slide, just to show you a couple of different um, uh, fishing archetypes within that, that fishery. Uh, so this is very much a work in progress. So I just have a bit of eye candy sort of to show you all. Um, but we were agent here, we're agentizing the, the, the boat. So each boat is an, is an agent. And then we're also developing as agents each FAD or each fish aggregation device, which is, or will be moving around the Eastern Pacific Ocean as per the oceanographic currents and, and such. And then um, we're modeling, in addition, the, the boat movement and, and vessels will leave port. 
come out, drop off their fads. Fads will float a while. They'll go back to them, uh, be able to find them and catch the fish that's under them. And then uh, once we sort of um, calibrated this model to, to data, the IETTC has been a great partner in terms of being able to uh, utilize a lot of their data sets to parameterize and then also calibrate the model. Uh, once it's calibrated, then we can start playing some, some different games with respect to uh, and, and looking at whether or not we can actually limit the number of fads um, uh, uh, or, or fad sets and if that would be an effective sort of policy measure for this fishery. I'll talk briefly about our uh, Indonesia work, um, which is a bit further along. So we've done uh, Indonesia's sort of a data poor fishery. So we threw a whole bunch of uh, data poor techniques at it to try and estimate, uh, generate estimates of fishing mortality and biomass. Um, and then if you were to just uh, sort of project that forward in time, you would get under current sort of levels of, of what we think fishing effort is, is, is happening, you get the sort of typical projection plots like this that people are used to seeing. However, um, there are quite a number of policies that the Indonesian government does not have an appetite for trying. So things like spatial management measures, they have like zero interest in um, tax and quota systems they don't have any interest in. So it, it leaves uh, us to with a very narrow range of policies that we could try and throw at this. And so um, one objective they had was trying to increase profits. So um, the fishing boats are in three general sizes. So by boat type, there are small, medium, and large longliner boats that, uh, that target a portion of this fishery. And so what we did was we asked the Poseidon model, we said, okay, well, here are the different um, policies we want to evaluate. We want to try and reduce uh, the amount of fishing effort for the medium and large boats, but we want to increase profits for the small boats because they were, um, the small kind of artisanal fleet was, was losing out and losing money as the larger sort of vessels were taking most of the catch. Uh, and then when we run this in Poseidon and ask the, ask the model to figure it out, it, comes up with the fact that, okay, well, you can reduce sort of your fishing effort somewhat um, for the large and, and medium boats, and that will then increase profits in the long run for, uh, say, in, you know, three, four, five years, where we start seeing some of the, the blue and purple shading for the smaller fleets. Finally, um, the way that I have uh, also used a lot of, uh, or used agent-based models is to sort of evaluate different um, uh, assumptions going into stock assessment. So here I was looking at whether to see whether or not um, the indices of abundance truly match up with what's going on in some of these systems. So in, in the southeastern part of the United States, indices of abundance, we, most of them come from the actual fishery dependent sources. So there's uh, obviously some bias there that's based on fisher behavior. And um, so I built this agent-based model where I actually agentized all the fish as well to sort of look at this problem. Um, and I then conducted stock assessments on the output of that model. Um, on the right are the, are the indices for the long line in red and the, the hand line fleet in blue. And then the actual truth is in, in black from the simulation. And then when you feed those into the stock assessment, into stock synthesis, and you change the, um, just simply changing the indices, you can actually get different reference point values, um, which is um, kind of scary. And there are clear reasons for that that have to do with um, sort of habitual fishing practices going on in this fishery and local depletion happening and people going to essentially the same locations over time. And you can um, see that with, with this grouper species as well. Um, and this is sort of the map sort of showing you uh, kind of what was going on in terms of uh, fishing behavior. And so you can sort of look at how using a framework like an agent-based model, you can recreate some of the more complex dynamics that are not as reliant on sort of um, numerical optimization or that you could not really achieve through numerical optimization. And then test those out in the sort of stock assessment framework to look at how certain things may or may not be biased in your assessment. Uh, lastly, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, um, I've done quite a bit of thinking about whether or not agent-based models can actually be dropped in uh, in place as as the actual operating unit for stock assessment. So, and I think the way um, it could be done, uh, and and well, what should it be done, done is the first question. And um, I think 
yes, it would be a useful exercise in terms of being able to, again, um, uh, better understand what's going on with fishing mortality such that it's not just reduced down to one numerical F parameter where you can then incorporate a lot more realism into your stock assessment with respect to how fishers are actually operating in the real world. Um, and so to do that, I think what you could do is develop your sort of agent-based model as, as I have, we've developed the Poseidon model and I've developed my Gulf of Mexico model, which has all these different processes in terms of the age and size structure, it's spatial, um, et cetera. And then you would have this sort of wrapper class or an optimizer where, which would sort of control the agent-based model. It would run it, take the output, plot it against the sort of uh, the, the, the indices and, and landings and discards and, and catch it age data, look at where the fit is, would adjust the, the per parameters, rerun the agent-based model, grab the output, and then you would kind of around you would go through this process until you found essentially the right parameters, just like we do with um, stock synthesis, the right parameters that kind of brought you to that global minimum. Um, pros of it or positive components would be that you would be able to more explicitly represent human behavior. So again, you would not have to make as many simplifying assumptions with respect to, to, uh, to that and, and that can propagate into selectivity and catchability and, and, and other areas of the assessment. Um, Fisher behavior could be adaptive um, and you could also get a lot more nuanced at spatial components. We were talking a lot about uh, earlier about sort of um, making the spatial component of our assessment models a little bit more nuanced and this could be a great way to do that. Uh, it's also multidisciplinary. It brings in the economists and social scientists not just at the management phase but throughout the entire assessment process in a more comprehensive way. And it's really nice to have a nice spatial component or video or something that you can then show stakeholders to help get them involved a bit more as well. Some uh, cons is that it, it can be, take a lot longer to run, um, but that also really depends on how you program your model. Um, I, for the Gulf model, we've got like 50 million agents running in about four hours, 20 years on a daily time step. So it really depends on how you structure your code and, 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 and when you update things and when you don't. Um, but it does certainly present a higher computational overhead than like stock synthesis would, for example, regardless. Um, it's you know, another con, as it is a pro, is that it's multidisciplinary, it takes more people, more collaboration. These models, agent-based models, tend to take a lot longer to develop as well, and that's not favorable in fisheries where we need an answer real quick. Um, and ABM expertise is somewhat limited in the fishery space, but arguably that's, that's increasing. Um, so in summary, agent-based models, I feel, have um, quite a few places within the fishery science and fisheries assessment realm and management realm. Uh, Poseidon is really ideally suited as a forecasting tool to better, uh, with, with more accuracy, uh, forecast what may or may not happen with certain policies. And agent-based models could, in the future, serve as some sort of an assessment framework if that was something that folks were interested in, in developing. Um, so thank you all uh, for the invite and, and for your time. Okay, thanks. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Nesta. No, well, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's um, actually part of what you said. I totally agree. I think we need to be more multidisciplinary and. Uh, Definitely, uh, I would like to have more cooperation with economists and, and sociologists about this this part of the of the of the, uh, the processes we are trying to model. Um, my experience with age-based models was not very uh, successful, and uh, the the problem we f the problem we had was that. Uh, in the end of the day, your, your agents are aggregated in three or four, I think in your case, you ended up with four categories. Mm -hmm. And those categories are pretty much based on their catch profile. What they catch, then they get into these boxes. And uh, there's not really an understanding of um, why an agent actually decides to do something on a particular day or on a particular month. The, the reasons behind the decision of I'm going to fish for, I think you had dolphins or I'm going to fish something else. Did you, in your, in your work, did you look into this kind of, of processes, the decision uh, uh, 
of potential decisions that these guys might take? Yeah, yeah. So in so I can answer that in two parts. On the Poseidon side, it's very yes. So we're we're develop trying to figure those things out by 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 developing very detailed fleet surveys for and so that's being implemented in Indonesia in in for the EPO tuna implementation um it's more through studying the data that we have so you know looking at um the logbook data and, and observer data and kind of what patterns you know what sort of decisions people made under certain conditions in my own work with my um the gulf of mexico model which is kind of my my baby i've spent a lot of time um personally with the fishers actually spending time with them drinking a lot of beer of course but it's like one for the team, you know, but um, it's actually spending time with them, you know, asking them, well, how the hell, when, you know, how do you operate? Can I go out with you? You know, let me, you know, teach me what you do. I want to know everything about what you do so I can model it properly. So I think a big part of it comes in that, in, into play there. And then I went and I fit a whole bunch of discrete choice models to their actual logbook operations and tried based on what I already knew then about the fishery, how they made different decisions and stuff, then I was able to sort of load in those factors and then get a quantitative representation of their behavior. And in my, my golf model, that's really what drives their, their behavior plus other things. So, um, so some argue then, well, it's not as dynamic. I mean, there are other, there are components that make it dynamic a little bit, but it also helps me then understand process wise why, as you say, not just oh yeah they're doing this on this day but why oh yeah it's because it's windy out it's because the price of fish dropped that they're not going out so um so some of that's elucidated on the front end but then on the back end and when you run the model and you look at the output some of that's also elucidated on the with the output right so then you know you have full information because you're playing god simulating this fishery you know what all the state conditions were and what the economic conditions were and then you can actually look at um why they made those certain decisions. I don't know if that addresses your question. Yeah, well, yeah, the question. Hello, yeah, cool. Hey, uh, cool, yeah, um, I like it, uh, yeah. I like the idea of using uh, agent-based models. I was interested in like what kind of language or program you use. Yeah, so both Poseidon and, and the, the golf model, I gotta figure out a name for that. I keep finding one and throwing it away because I hate it or it doesn't like form a nice acronym. <laughs> um, both are, are coded in Java. Um, and, um, but you know, it doesn't matter. They can be coded in whatever, pick your poison favorite language. But they're both coded in Java and they're both, um, are bo they both employ uh, a library for developing agent-based models called Mason that was developed at George Mason University, which develops some, some of the functionality like grids, like this time scheduler and stuff like that, so that you don't have to quite reinvent the wheel entirely, which is good. Um, it, to people's question about coder, use a programmer or not, the, the, uh, now we have the Poseidon, model has two programmers uh, who are based at Oxford University who are just doing that, just working on the code to that. Um, it's worked really well. I've sort of served as the biologist liaison to sort of give, you know, give them things like the double normal function because we're pulling output from stock synthesis and selectivity functions and sort of, so I can talk with folks more about what it's like offline sort of being that kind of conduit. The golf model, I, that was originally my thesis work, so I coded the first implementation of that. Then I hired a programmer who took one look at it and said, yuck, and rewrote the whole thing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that's gone really well as well in terms of communicating. But, but it is important to be in lockstep with that person who's coding because there are things that they don't know that you know about fisheries and vice versa. There are things that they know about programming that I don't know that, that can go wrong. Um, possibly. Yeah. Well, well just a more sort of a, sort of a simple question. Uh, um, the, you, you say that the, your model is going to be, uh, the biological models are very simple in these, uh, these Poseidon models or whatever you call them. 
Um, so how do you div how sort of how do you parameterize the uh, the spatial model which you how how, how where your catches are being taken from? Yep, that's a good question. So the um, well the bio the biology is just standard age structure um, biology that you would have in any old other stock assessment model in the Poseidon model anyway. The the golf model is also age structure, but I have every fish represented, and then I've also got movement and some other stuff more complex going on in there that I can talk about another time. But um, the 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 spatial components so it's it's tricky that's and that's probably the hardest part is that if you want to do this in a place that's data poor like indonesia where you don't have a good spatial um map in terms of where fish biomass is then you really need to start making some assumptions so in indonesia it's going to be this very blocky 10 area model where you only have 10 regions because we know what's going on in those 10 broad regions across the country um, we, I did develop, a, we developed sort of a, a finer scale spatial distribution of abundance, but we don't have good habitat data, so, I, so we don't trust that very well. So there's going to be kind of a, a multiple scale thing going on where we have this sort of higher level thing that we trust better, and then sort of a test case, more finer scale resolution version where, you know, we don't trust really where the fish are spatially there that well. Um, typically, though, uh, essential fish habitat maps are useful inputs to sort of um, parameterizing where to initialize fish in, in, and where to put new recruits in, in the simulation. Um, and then I've all often, at least for my work, own work, I've often done a lot of mapping work or had to do a lot of mapping work ahead of time to, to generate sort of spatial distributions for input to these things. So it, it can be tricky. Okay, we should uh, move on to the discussion session, but you can bring up these questions and that as well. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know whose clicker is. We both have the same one. I didn't realize what kind of clicker.